Let's practice English with the Wizard of Oz. This is part three of six. If you like these exercises, subscribe now to get more. Keep in mind the translation is not exact. It has been modified to sound better in Spanish. Let's begin the reading. Empecemos la lectura. Chapter 9, The Queen of the Field Mice We cannot be far from the road of yellow brick, now, remarked the scarecrow, as he stood beside the girl, for we have come nearly as far as the river carried us away. The tin woodman was about to reply when he heard a low growl, and turning his head, which worked beautifully on hinges, he saw a strange beast come bounding over the grass toward them. It was, indeed, a great yellow wildcat, and the woodman thought it must be chasing something, for its ears were lying close to its head and its mouth was wide open, showing two rows of ugly teeth, while its red eyes glowed like balls of fire. As it came nearer the tin woodman saw that running before the beast was a little gray field mouse, and although he had no heart he knew it was wrong for the wild cat to try to kill such a pretty, harmless creature. So the woodman raised his axe, and as the wild cat ran by he gave it a quick blow that cut the beast's head clean off from its body, and it rolled over at his feet in two pieces. The field mouse now that it was freed from its enemy, stopped short, and coming slowly up to the woodman it said, in a squeaky little voice. Oh, thank you. Thank you ever so much for saving my life. Don't speak of it, I beg of you, replied the woodman. I have no heart, you know, so I am careful to help all those who may need a friend, even if it happens to be only a mouse. Only a mouse! cried the little animal, indignantly. Why, I am a queen, the queen of all the field mice. Oh, indeed, said the woodman, making a bow. Therefore you have done a great deed, as well as a brave one, in saving my life, added the queen. At that moment several mice were seen running up as fast as their little legs could carry them, and when they saw their queen they exclaimed, Oh, your majesty, we thought you would be killed. How did you manage to escape the great wildcat? They all bowed so low to the little queen that they almost stood upon their heads. This funny tin man, she answered, killed the wildcat and saved my life. So hereafter you must all serve him, and obey his slightest wish. We will, cried all the mice, in a shrill chorus. And then they scampered in all directions, for Toto had awakened from his sleep, and seeing all these mice around him he gave one bark of delight and jumped right into the middle of the group. Toto had always loved to chase mice when he lived in Kansas, and he saw no harm in it. But the tin woodman caught the dog in his arms and held him tight, while he called to the mice, Come back! Come back! Toto shall not hurt you! At this the queen of the mice stuck her head out from underneath the clump of grass and asked, in a timid voice, Are you sure he will not bite us? I will not let him, said the woodman, so do not be afraid. One by one the mice came creeping back, and Toto did not bark again, although he tried to get out of the woodman's arms, and would have bitten him had he not known very well he was made of tin. Finally one of the biggest mice spoke. Is there anything we can do, it asked, to repay you for saving the life of our queen? Nothing that I know of, answered the woodman, but the scarecrow who had been trying to think, but could not because his head was stuffed with straw, said, quickly, Oh, yes, you can save our friend, the cowardly lion, who is asleep in the poppy bed. 
a lion, cried the little queen. Why, he would eat us all up. Oh, no, declared the scarecrow, this lion is a coward. Really? asked the mouse. He says so himself, answered the scarecrow, and he would never hurt anyone who is our friend. If you will help us to save him I promise that he shall treat you all with kindness. Very well, said the queen, we trust you. But what shall we do? Are there many of these mice which call you queen and are willing to obey you? Oh, yes, there are thousands, she replied. Then send for them all to come here as soon as possible, and let each one bring a long piece of string. The queen turned to the mice that attended her and told them to go at once and get all her people. As soon as they heard her orders they ran away in every direction as fast as possible. Now, said the scarecrow to the tin woodman, you must go to those trees by the riverside and make a truck that will carry the lion. So the woodman went at once to the trees and began to work, and he soon made a truck out of the limbs of trees, from which he chopped away all the leaves and branches. He fastened it together with wooden pegs and made the four wheels out of short pieces of a big tree trunk. So fast and so well did he work that by the time the mice began to arrive the truck was all ready for them. They came from all directions, and there were thousands of them, big mice and little mice and middle-sized mice, and each one brought a piece of string in his mouth. It was about this time that Dorothy woke from her long sleep and opened her eyes. She was greatly astonished to find herself lying upon the grass, with thousands of mice standing around and looking at her timidly. But the scarecrow told her about everything, and turning to the dignified little mouse, he said, Permit me to introduce to you Her Majesty, the Queen. Dorothy nodded gravely and the queen made a curtsy, after which she became quite friendly with the little girl. The scarecrow and the woodman now began to fasten the mice to the truck, using the strings they had brought. One end of a string was tied around the neck of each mouse and the other end to the truck. Of course the truck was a thousand times bigger than any of the mice who were to draw it, but when all the mice had been harnessed, they were able to pull it quite easily. Even the scarecrow and the tin woodman could sit on it, and were drawn swiftly by their queer little horses to the place where the lion lay asleep. After a great deal of hard work, for the lion was heavy, they managed to get him up on the truck. Then the queen hurriedly gave her people the order to start, for she feared if the mice stayed among the poppies too long they also would fall asleep. At first the little creatures, many though they were, could hardly stir the heavily loaded truck, but the woodman and the scarecrow both pushed from behind, and they got along better. Soon they rolled the lion out of the poppy bed to the green fields, where he could breathe the sweet, fresh air again, instead of the poisonous scent of the flowers. Dorothy came to meet them and thanked the little mice warmly for saving her companion from death. She had grown so fond of the big lion she was glad he had been rescued. Then the mice were unharnessed from the truck and scampered away through the grass to their homes. The queen of the mice was the last to leave. If ever you need us again, she said, come out into the field and call and we shall hear you and come to your assistance. Goodbye. Goodbye. They all answered, and away the queen ran, while Dorothy held Toto tightly lest he should run after her and frighten her. After this they sat down beside the lion until he should awaken, and the scarecrow brought Dorothy some fruit from a tree nearby, which she ate for her dinner. Chapter 10 the Guardian of the Gate It was some time before the cowardly lion awakened, for he had lain among the poppies a long while, breathing in their deadly fragrance, 
but when he did open his eyes and roll off the truck he was very glad to find himself still alive. I ran as fast as I could, he said, sitting down and yawning, but the flowers were too strong for me. How did you get me out? Then they told him of the field mice, and how they had generously saved him from death, and the cowardly lion laughed, and said, I have always thought myself very big and terrible, yet such little things as flowers came near to killing me, and such small animals as mice have saved my life. How strange it all is! But, comrades, what shall we do now? We must journey on until we find the road of yellow brick again, said Dorothy, and then we can keep on to the Emerald City. So, the lion being fully refreshed, and feeling quite himself again, they all started upon the journey, greatly enjoying the walk through the soft, fresh grass, and it was not long before they reached the road of yellow brick and turned again toward the Emerald City where the Great Oz dwelt. The road was smooth and well paved, now, and the country about was beautiful, so that the travelers rejoiced in leaving the forest far behind, and with it the many dangers they had met in its gloomy shades. Once more they could see fences built beside the road, but these were painted green, and when they came to a small house, in which a farmer evidently lived, that also was painted green. They passed by several of these houses during the afternoon, and sometimes people came to the doors and looked at them as if they would like to ask questions. But no one came near them nor spoke to them because of the great lion, of which they were very much afraid. The people were all dressed in clothing of a lovely emerald green color and wore peaked hats like those of the munchkins. This must be the land of Oz, said Dorothy and we are surely getting near the Emerald City. Yes, answered the Scarecrow. Everything is green here, while in the country of the Munchkins blue was the favorite color. But the people do not seem to be as friendly as the Munchkins, and I'm afraid we shall be unable to find a place to pass the night. I should like something to eat besides fruit, said the girl, and I'm sure Toto is nearly starved. Let us stop at the next house and talk to the people. So, when they came to a good-sized farmhouse, Dorothy walked boldly up to the door and knocked. A woman opened it just far enough to look out, and said, What do you want, child, and why is that great lion with you? We wish to pass the night with you, if you will allow us, answered Dorothy and the lion is my friend and comrade, and would not hurt you for the world. Is he tame? asked the woman, opening the door a little wider. Oh, yes, said the girl, and he is a great coward too. He will be more afraid of you than you are of him. Well, said the woman, after thinking it over and taking another peep at the lion, if that is the case you may come in, and I will give you some supper and a place to sleep. So they all entered the house, where there were, besides the woman, two children and a man. The man had hurt his leg, and was lying on the couch in a corner. They seemed greatly surprised to see so strange a company, and while the woman was busy laying the table the man asked, Where are you all going? To the Emerald City, said Dorothy, to see the Great Oz. Oh, indeed! exclaimed the man. Are you sure that Oz will see you? Why not? she replied. Why, it is said that he never lets anyone come into his presence. I have been to the Emerald City many times, and it is a beautiful and wonderful place but I have never been permitted to see the great Oz, nor do I know of any living person who has seen him. Does he never go out? asked the Scarecrow. Never. He sits day after day in the great throne room of his palace, 
and even those who wait upon him do not see him face to face. What is he like? asked the girl. That is hard to tell, said the man thoughtfully. You see, Oz is a great wizard, and can take on any form he wishes. So that some say he looks like a bird, and some say he looks like an elephant, and some say he looks like a cat. To others he appears as a beautiful fairy, or a brownie, or in any other form that pleases him. But who the real Oz is, when he is in his own form, no living person can tell. That is very strange, said Dorothy, but we must try, in some way, to see him, or we shall have made our journey for nothing. Why do you wish to see the terrible Oz? asked the man. I want him to give me some brains, said the scarecrow eagerly. Oh, Oz could do that easily enough, declared the man. He has more brains than he needs. And I want him to give me a heart, said the tin woodman. That will not trouble him, continued the man, for Oz has a large collection of hearts, of all sizes and shapes. And I want him to give me courage, said the cowardly lion. Oz keeps a great pot of courage in his throne room, said the man, which he has covered with a golden plate, to keep it from running over. He will be glad to give you some. And I want him to send me back to Kansas, said Dorothy. Where is Kansas? asked the man, with surprise. I don't know, replied Dorothy sorrowfully, but it is my home, and I'm sure it's somewhere. Very likely. Well, us can do anything, so I suppose he will find Kansas for you. But first you must get to see him, and that will be a hard task, for the great wizard does not like to see anyone, and he usually has his own way. But what do you want? He continued. Speaking to Toto. Toto only wagged his tail, for, strange to say, he could not speak. The woman now called to them that supper was ready, so they gathered around the table and Dorothy ate some delicious porridge and a dish of scrambled eggs and a plate of nice white bread, and enjoyed her meal. The lion ate some of the porridge, but did not care for it saying it was made from oats and oats were food for horses, not for lions. The scarecrow and the tin woodman ate nothing at all. Toto ate a little of everything, and was glad to get a good supper again. The woman now gave Dorothy a bed to sleep in, and Toto lay down beside her, while the lion guarded the door of her room so she might not be disturbed. The scarecrow and the tin woodman stood up in a corner and kept quiet all night, although of course they could not sleep. The next morning, as soon as the sun was up, they started on their way, and soon saw a beautiful green glow in the sky just before them. That must be the Emerald City, said Dorothy. As they walked on, the green glow became brighter and brighter and it seemed that at last they were nearing the end of their travels. Yet it was afternoon before they came to the great wall that surrounded the city. It was high and thick and of a bright green color. In front of them, and at the end of the road of yellow brick, was a big gate, all studded with emeralds that glittered so in the sun that even the painted eyes of the scarecrow were dazzled by their brilliancy. There was a bell beside the gate, and Dorothy pushed the button and heard a silvery tinkle sound within. Then the big gate swung slowly open, and they all passed through and found themselves in a high arched room, the walls of which glistened with countless emeralds. Before them stood a little man about the same size as the munchkins. He was clothed all in green, from his head to his feet, and even his skin was of a greenish tint. At his side was a large green box. When he saw Dorothy and her companions the man asked, 
What do you wish in the Emerald City? We came here to see the Great Oz, said Dorothy. The man was so surprised at this answer that he sat down to think it over. It has been many years since anyone asked me to see Oz, he said, shaking his head in perplexity. He is powerful and terrible, and if you come on an idle or foolish errand to bother the wise reflections of the great wizard, he might be angry and destroy you all in an instant. But it is not a foolish errand, nor an idle one, replied the scarecrow, it is important. And we have been told that Oz is a good wizard. So he is, said the green man, and he rules the Emerald City wisely and well. But to those who are not honest, or who approach him from curiosity, he is most terrible, and few have ever dared ask to see his face. I am the guardian of the gates, and since you demand to see the great as I must take you to his palace. But first you must put on the spectacles. Why? asked Dorothy. Because if you did not wear spectacles the brightness and glory of the Emerald City would blind you. Even those who live in the city must wear spectacles night and day. They are all locked on, for Oz so ordered it when the city was first built, and I have the only key that will unlock them. He opened the big box, and Dorothy saw that it was filled with spectacles of every size and shape. All of them had green glasses in them. The guardian of the gates found a pair that would just fit Dorothy and put them over her eyes. There were two golden bands fastened to them that passed around the back of her head, where they were locked together by a little key that was at the end of a chain the guardian of the gates wore around his neck. When they were on, Dorothy could not take them off had she wished, but of course she did not wish to be blinded by the glare of the Emerald City, so she said nothing. Then the green man fitted spectacles for the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion, and even on little Toto, and all were locked fast with the key. Then the guardian of the gates put on his own glasses and told them he was ready to show them to the palace. Taking a big golden key from a peg on the wall, he opened another gate, and they all followed him through the portal into the streets of the Emerald City. Chapter 11 The Wonderful City of Oz Even with eyes protected by the green spectacles, Dorothy and her friends were at first dazzled by the brilliancy of the wonderful city. The streets were lined with beautiful houses all built of green marble and studded everywhere with sparkling emeralds. They walked over a pavement of the same green marble, and where the blocks were joined together were rows of emeralds, set closely, and glittering in the brightness of the sun. The window panes were of green glass, even the sky above the city had a green tint, and the rays of the sun were green. There were many people, men, women, and children, walking about, and these were all dressed in green clothes and had greenish skins. They looked at Dorothy and her strangely assorted company with wondering eyes, and the children all ran away and hid behind their mothers when they saw the lion, but no one spoke to them. Many shops stood in the street, and Dorothy saw that everything in them was green. Green candy and green popcorn were offered for sale, as well as green shoes, green hats, and green clothes of all sorts. At one place a man was selling green lemonade, and when the children bought it Dorothy could see that they paid for it with green pennies. There seemed to be no horses nor animals of any kind, the men carried things around in little green carts, which they pushed before them. Everyone seemed happy and contented and prosperous. The guardian of the gates led them through the streets until they came to a big building, exactly in the middle of the city, which was the Palace of Oz, the Great Wizard. There was a soldier before the door, dressed in a green uniform and wearing a long green beard. Here are strangers, said the guardian of the gates to him, and they demand to see the Great Oz. 
Step inside, answered the soldier, and I will carry your message to him. So they passed through the palace gates and were led into a big room with a green carpet and lovely green furniture set with emeralds. The soldier made them all wipe their feet upon a green mat before entering this room, and when they were seated he said politely, Please make yourselves comfortable while I go to the door of the throne room and tell us you are here. They had to wait a long time before the soldier returned. When, at last, he came back, Dorothy asked. Have you seen Oz? Oh, no, returned the soldier, I have never seen him. But I spoke to him as he sat behind his screen and gave him your message. He said he will grant you an audience, if you so desire, but each one of you must enter his presence alone, and he will admit but one each day. Therefore, as you must remain in the palace for several days, I will have you shown to rooms where you may rest in comfort after your journey. Thank you, replied the girl, that is very kind of Oz. The soldier now blew upon a green whistle, and at once a young girl, dressed in a pretty green silk gown, entered the room. She had lovely green hair and green eyes, and she bowed low before Dorothy as she said, Follow me and I will show you your room. So Dorothy said goodbye to all her friends except Toto, and taking the dog in her arms followed the green girl through seven passages and up three flights of stairs until they came to a room at the front of the palace. It was the sweetest little room in the world, with a soft comfortable bed that had sheets of green silk and a green velvet counterpane. There was a tiny fountain in the middle of the room, that shot a spray of green perfume into the air, to fall back into a beautifully carved green marble basin. Beautiful green flowers stood in the windows, and there was a shelf with a row of little green books. When Dorothy had time to open these books she found them full of queer green pictures that made her laugh, they were so funny. In a wardrobe were many green dresses, made of silk and satin and velvet, and all of them fitted Dorothy exactly. Make yourself perfectly at home, said the green girl and if you wish for anything ring the bell. Oz will send for you tomorrow morning. She left Dorothy alone and went back to the others. These she also led to rooms, and each one of them found himself lodged in a very pleasant part of the palace. Of course this politeness was wasted on the scarecrow. For when he found himself alone in his room he stood stupidly in one spot, just within the doorway to wait till morning. It would not rest him to lie down, and he could not close his eyes, so he remained all night staring at a little spider which was weaving its web in a corner of the room, just as if it were not one of the most wonderful rooms in the world. The tin woodman lay down on his bed from force of habit, for he remembered when he was made of flesh, but not being able to sleep, he passed the night moving his joints up and down to make sure they kept in good working order. The lion would have preferred a bed of dried leaves in the forest, and did not like being shut up in a room, but he had too much sense to let this worry him, so he sprang upon the bed and rolled himself up like a cat and purred himself asleep in a minute. The next morning, after breakfast, the green maiden came to fetch Dorothy and she dressed her in one of the prettiest gowns, made of green brocaded satin. Dorothy put on a green silk apron and tied a green ribbon around Toto's neck, and they started for the throne room of the Great Oz. First they came to a great hall in which were many ladies and gentlemen of the court, all dressed in rich costumes. These people had nothing to do but talk to each other, but they always came to wait outside the throne room every morning although they were never permitted to see Oz. As Dorothy entered they looked at her curiously, and one of them whispered, Are you really going to look upon the face of Oz the Terrible? Of course, answered the girl, if he will see me. 
Oh, he will see you, said the soldier who had taken her message to the wizard, although he does not like to have people ask to see him. Indeed, at first he was angry and said I should send you back where you came from. Then he asked me what you looked like, and when I mentioned your silver shoes he was very much interested. At last I told him about the mark upon your forehead, and he decided he would admit you to his presence. Just then a bell rang, and the green girl said to Dorothy, That is the signal. You must go into the throne room alone. She opened a little door and Dorothy walked boldly through and found herself in a wonderful place. It was a big, round room with a high arched roof, and the walls and ceiling and floor were covered with large emeralds set closely together. In the center of the roof was a great light, as bright as the sun, which made the emeralds sparkle in a wonderful manner. But what interested Dorothy most was the big throne of green marble that stood in the middle of the room. It was shaped like a chair and sparkled with gems, as did everything else. In the center of the chair was an enormous head, without a body to support it or any arms or legs whatever. There was no hair upon this head, but it had eyes and a nose and mouth, and was much bigger than the head of the biggest giant. As Dorothy gazed upon this in wonder and fear, the eyes turned slowly and looked at her sharply and steadily. Then the mouth moved, and Dorothy heard a voice say, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? It was not such an awful voice as she had expected to come from the big head, so she took courage and answered, I am Dorothy the small and meek. I have come to you for help. The eyes looked at her thoughtfully for a full minute. Then said the voice, Where did you get the silver shoes? I got them from the wicked witch of the east, when my house fell on her and killed her, she replied. Where did you get the mark upon your forehead? Continued the voice. That is where the good witch of the north kissed me when she bade me goodbye and sent me to you, said the girl. Again the eyes looked at her sharply, and they saw she was telling the truth. Then Oz asked, What do you wish me to do? Send me back to Kansas, where my Aunt Em and Uncle Henry are, she answered earnestly. I don't like your country, although it is so beautiful and I am sure Aunt Em will be dreadfully worried over my being away so long. The eyes winked three times, and then they turned up to the ceiling and down to the floor and rolled around so queerly that they seemed to see every part of the room. And at last they looked at Dorothy again. Why should I do this for you? asked Oz. Because you are strong and I am weak because you are a great wizard and I am only a little girl. But you were strong enough to kill the wicked witch of the east, said Oz. That just happened, returned Dorothy simply, I could not help it. Well, said the head, I will give you my answer. You have no right to expect me to send you back to Kansas unless you do something for me in return. In this country everyone must pay for everything he gets. If you wish me to use my magic power to send you home again you must do something for me first. Help me and I will help you. What must I do? asked the girl. Kill the wicked witch of the west, answered Oz. But I cannot, exclaimed Dorothy, greatly surprised. You killed the witch of the east and you wear the silver shoes, which bear a powerful charm. There is now but one wicked witch left in all this land, and when you can tell me she is dead I will send you back to Kansas, but not before. The little girl began to weep, she was so much disappointed, and the eyes winked again and looked upon her anxiously, as if the great Oz felt that she could help him if she would. 
I never killed anything, willingly, she sobbed. Even if I wanted to, how could I kill the wicked witch? If you, who are great and terrible, cannot kill her yourself, how do you expect me to do it? I do not know, said the head, but that is my answer, and until the wicked witch dies you will not see your uncle and aunt again. Remember that the witch is wicked, tremendously wicked, and ought to be killed. Now go, and do not ask to see me again until you have done your task. Sorrowfully Dorothy left the throne room and went back where the lion and then the scarecrow and the tin woodman were waiting to hear what Oz had said to her. There is no hope for me, she said sadly, for Oz will not send me home until I have killed the wicked witch of the West, and that I can never do. Her friends were sorry, but could do nothing to help her, so Dorothy went to her own room and lay down on the bed and cried herself to sleep. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the scarecrow and said, Come with me, for Oz has sent for you. So the scarecrow followed him and was admitted into the great throne room, where he saw, sitting in the emerald throne, a most lovely lady. She was dressed in green silk gauze and wore upon her flowing green locks a crown of jewels. Growing from her shoulders were wings, gorgeous in color and so light that they fluttered if the slightest breath of air reached them. When the scarecrow had bowed, as prettily as his straw stuffing would let him, before this beautiful creature, she looked upon him sweetly, and said, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? Now the scarecrow, who had expected to see the great head Dorothy had told him of, was much astonished, but he answered her bravely. I am only a scarecrow, stuffed with straw. Therefore I have no brains, and I come to you praying that you will put brains in my head instead of straw, so that I may become as much a man as any other in your dominions. Why should I do this for you? asked the lady. Because you are wise and powerful, and no one else can help me, answered the scarecrow. I never grant favors without some return, said Oz, but this much I will promise. If you will kill for me the wicked witch of the West, I will bestow upon you a great many brains, and such good brains that you will be the wisest man in all the land of Oz. I thought you asked Dorothy to kill the witch said the scarecrow, in surprise. So I did. I don't care who kills her. But until she is dead I will not grant your wish. Now go, and do not seek me again until you have earned the brains you so greatly desire. The scarecrow went sorrowfully back to his friends and told them what Oz had said, and Dorothy was surprised to find that the great wizard was not ahead, as she had seen him but a lovely lady. All the same, said the scarecrow, she needs a heart as much as the tin woodman. On the next morning the soldier with the green whiskers came to the tin woodman and said, Oz has sent for you. Follow me. So the tin woodman followed him and came to the great throne room. He did not know whether he would find Oz a lovely lady or a head, but he hoped it would be the lovely lady. For, he said to himself, if it is the head, I am sure I shall not be given a heart, since a head has no heart of its own and therefore cannot feel for me. But if it is the lovely lady I shall beg hard for a heart, for all ladies are themselves said to be kindly hearted. But when the woodman entered the great throne room he saw neither the head nor the lady, for Oz had taken the shape of a most terrible beast. It was nearly as big as an elephant, and the green throne seemed hardly strong enough to hold its weight. The beast had a head like that of a rhinoceros, only there were five eyes in its face. There were five long arms growing out of its body, and it also had five long, 
slim legs, thick, woolly hair covered every part of it, and a more dreadful-looking monster could not be imagined. It was fortunate the Tin Woodman had no heart at that moment, for it would have beat loud and fast from terror. But being only tin, the Woodman was not at all afraid, although he was much disappointed. I am Oz, the great and terrible, spoke the beast, in a voice that was one great roar. Who are you, and why do you seek me? I am a woodman, and made of tin. Therefore I have no heart, and cannot love. I pray you to give me a heart that I may be as other men are. Why should I do this? demanded the beast. Because I ask it, and you alone can grant my request, answered the woodman. Oz gave a low growl at this, but said, gruffly, If you indeed desire a heart, you must earn it. How? asked the woodman. Help Dorothy to kill the wicked witch of the West, replied the beast. When the witch is dead, come to me, and I will then give you the biggest and kindest and most loving heart in all the land of Oz. So the tin woodman was forced to return sorrowfully to his friends and tell them of the terrible beast he had seen. They all wondered greatly at the many forms the great wizard could take upon himself, and the lion said, If he is a beast when I go to see him, I shall roar my loudest, and so frighten him that he will grant all I ask. And if he is the lovely lady, I shall pretend to spring upon her, and so compel her to do my bidding. And if he is the great head, he will be at my mercy, for I will roll this head all about the room until he promises to give us what we desire. So be of good cheer, my friends, for all will yet be well. The next morning the soldier with the green whiskers led the lion to the great throne room and bade him enter the presence of Oz. The lion at once passed through the door, and glancing around saw, to his surprise, that before the throne was a ball of fire, so fierce and glowing he could scarcely bear to gaze upon it. His first thought was that Oz had by accident caught on fire and was burning up, but when he tried to go nearer, the heat was so intense that it singed his whiskers, and he crept back tremblingly to a spot nearer the door. Then a low, quiet voice came from the ball of fire, and these were the words it spoke. I am Oz, the great and terrible. Who are you, and why do you seek me? And the lion answered, I am a cowardly lion, afraid of everything. I came to you to beg that you give me courage, so that in reality I may become the king of beasts, as men call me. Why should I give you courage? demanded Oz. Because of all wizards you are the greatest, and alone have power to grant my request, answered the lion. The ball of fire burned fiercely for a time, and the voice said, Bring me proof that the wicked witch is dead and that moment I will give you courage. But as long as the witch lives, you must remain a coward. The lion was angry at this speech, but could say nothing in reply, and while he stood silently gazing at the ball of fire it became so furiously hot that he turned tail and rushed from the room. He was glad to find his friends waiting for him, and told them of his terrible interview with the wizard. What shall we do now? asked Dorothy sadly. There is only one thing we can do, returned the lion, and that is to go to the land of the Winkies, seek out the wicked witch, and destroy her. But suppose we cannot? said the girl. Then I shall never have courage, declared the lion. And I shall never have brains, added the scarecrow. And I shall never have a heart, spoke the tin woodman. And I shall never see Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, said Dorothy, beginning to cry. Be careful, cried the green girl. 
The tears will fall on your green silk gown and spot it. So Dorothy dried her eyes and said, I suppose we must try it, but I am sure I do not want to kill anybody, even to see Aunt Em again. I will go with you, but I'm too much of a coward to kill the witch, said the lion. I will go too, declared the scarecrow, but I shall not be of much help to you, I am such a fool. I haven't the heart to harm even a witch, remarked the tin woodman, but if you go I certainly shall go with you. Therefore it was decided to start upon their journey the next morning, and the woodman sharpened his axe on a green grindstone and had all his joints properly oiled. The scarecrow stuffed himself with fresh straw and Dorothy put new paint on his eyes that he might see better. The green girl, who was very kind to them, filled Dorothy's basket with good things to eat, and fastened a little bell around Toto's neck with a green ribbon. They went to bed quite early and slept soundly until daylight, when they were awakened by the crowing of a green cock that lived in the backyard of the palace, and the cackling of a hen that had laid a green egg. ¿Te han gustado los ejercicios? Dale a like y suscríbete para no perderte los siguientes videos. También dinos en los comentarios qué tipos de ejercicios quieres ver. Suscríbete a nuestro canal My English Go si quieres encontrar lecciones con explicaciones y estrategias para aprender inglés.